Once again, good morning, church. Good morning. Here we go. There was one good morning that really stood out on this side. I didn't catch quite who. That was great, though. Now, it's certainly wonderful to see everyone this morning, both uh, members and visitors alike. To our visitors, we're thankful that you have taken the opportunity to be with us this Lord's Day morning and uh, to worship our God together in spirit and in truth. We also want to extend a welcome to those who will be watching our services online and later on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, thankful that uh, you are joining us as well. We look uh, forward to having you in person and uh, meeting with us so that we can meet you, tell you a little bit about us, learn more about you, and uh, hopefully walk closer to Christ together. That's, that's our goal. If this is your first time visiting here, then you should know we speak where the Bible speaks. We're silent where the Bible is silent. That being said, we are still imperfect people. So if you came here looking to visit somewhere where people are perfect, you've come to the wrong place. Let me just tell you that now. But you're not going to find a place uh, that's perfect. Not here on this earth anyways. Because uh, I'll tell you, even if I found a perfect congregation, the moment I walk in the doors, it is not perfect because I am not perfect. So what we'd like you to have is the Word of God. We'd like you to have come here meeting God's people, hearing the Word of God, and ultimately leaving with that. So if you don't have a Bible of your own, as you exit the auditorium, you'll see a bookshelf there with several translations. Please take one of those with our compliments. You know, I was looking online at my last several sermons as to their length. They've been a little long lately, haven't they? You know, I'm kind of reminded of, uh, you know, this joke on, well, how does a preacher time his sermons? And it was that one preacher, he would take a, uh, a throat lozenge and he would put it in his mouth. And when the throat lozenge had dissolved, he knew he was done. And then one Sunday morning, he accidentally put, in a, put a button in his mouth instead. He never sat down. So I'll try to keep it a little bit more, more brief th this morning. You know, my, when my maternal grandmother was just about three months pregnant with my mom back in 1948, her husband, my grandfather was murdered. He had just gotten paid and he was walking home on his way one night from work and he was mugged and then they drowned him in six inches of water. I never met him. When I was seven years old, the oldest memory that I can say was mine and not something that someone had told me or from a, a photograph. And I believe that this is probably the oldest memory that I have. My sisters, my father and mother and I, we, we, were dry, we drove to Georgia to visit my aunts and cousins and my dad's parents. I met my grandfather for what I remember being the first time. And then he died the next day. Fast forward to November of 1992. I'm 15. And I remember being in the living room when my dad got a phone call from Georgia. It was just the, the two of us in the house. And I remember him sitting on a stool in the counter. That's when, you know, the phones were still attached and had the cords. And he was sitting there. And again, it was just the two of us. And I remember him just breaking down in tears. He got word from his sister that his mother had died. Them living in Georgia, I had only met them a couple of times, and then she was gone. That same time, my other grandmother, my mother's mother, she was living with us in Colleen. And then a month after my dad got word that his mother had died, my other grandmother died on Christmas morning. Move along another three years and a childhood friend would commit suicide in the middle of his parents' garden. I can still recall that afternoon and me turning 
the house just next to his, just turning the corner just in time to see him pull the trigger. That was just the first suicide. There'd be two more that followed. Earlier in our marriage, there was a span about, of about six years when, when we lost two of Rachel's uncles, both of our fathers. Hers was buried on his birthday. And she lost both of her grandmothers. It seemed to me that I might met death much earlier than I should have. And that it's been a part of my life much more than is necessary for me to understand that we are ju given just so much time before we're to meet our maker. But I suppose that's true for a lot of us nowadays. You know, growing up and to a degree in adulthood, I believed that death took a particular interest in my family. But now as I look around, especially us, after us having to cope with this pandemic for the last two years, it seems that death has taken a keener interest in all of us. When I was putting together the message for this morning, I checked and 6.17 million people in the world have died from coronavirus. I would certainly be surprised if there was a single person in this room who didn't know one, at least one person who had died from COVID-19. But even if your life has gone untouched by the current health crisis, it has not been unaffected by death. Think now to the loved ones that you've lost. A spouse, a relative, a friend, a co-worker, a former elder, a former minister. And though it is as natural to die as it is to be born, that does not mean that coping with it is easy. It's been said that death is the great equalizer. Young, old, rich, poor, tall, short, man, woman, black, white, it doesn't matter. Death doesn't care if it robs a child of the only grandparent that they've ever known. It doesn't matter to death if someone dies in a car accident on the way to their own wedding. It makes no difference to death if it comes suddenly or if it takes its time. Yet as tragic as it may be, we are all bonded together by it. It's one thing that we know what it's like to lose someone, to see their face only in photographs or in a dream, but never at the dinner table or across the aisle where you would worship God together to perhaps hear their voice on a video but not on the phone. And if you're anything like me, the older you get, the more you start to consider the end. Was I a good husband or wife? A good parent or grandparent? A good friend? What would I have done differently? What I wouldn't give to go back and change such and such or do this or that. What I wouldn't give for just a little bit more time. But it's not just us. It's our loved ones. How, how will they manage without me? Will they be angry that I left them? Will they be upset at God that this happened and blame Him and in blaming Him risk their own salvation? Will they become so bitter that they discount God altogether? And you know, the more I think about it, and I might be wrong here, feel free to disagree, but, but the more I think about it, the more I've come to believe that it isn't just death or that it's not necessarily death that we're afraid of. I, I believe that what we fear is leaving everything behind. After all, this world is all that we've ever known. From the flowers in our front yards to the rain of a spring morning. 
from the annoyingly long red light on the corner to the clerk in the grocery store. Gone. All of it disappears in the blink of an eye. We draw our last breath, close our eyes, and it's all gone. Now, I don't think it's death we're afraid of. I think it's the disappearance of everything. And I believe that out of all the things we leave behind, our loved ones are what we fear for the most. And that's why this subject is so important, because you and I have both come face to face with death in one form or another, and because we'll come face to face with it again. It is a matter of if, but when. And so this morning, we'll look at death for the Christian. Through the comfort of Scripture, my prayer is that you will see that there's no reason to be afraid. Not of dying, nor of leaving it all behind. We realize that for those who rest in the abiding presence of Christ each day, there is a peace that passes all understanding. And that's where we need to get to today. To understand that peace. Because fear, especially a fear of death, it's a powerful force. And often we don't see that force until it's too late. And often we don't talk about death until it's happened and we're there at a funeral remembering someone who's passed. It's normal to fear death. Jesus didn't belittle death and we're not here to fault it either. And we need to understand that there's both a healthy fear of death and a sinful fear of death. The Puritan Thomas Brooks captures the mentality of a healthy fear in his book, The Transcendent Excellency of a Believer's Portion Above All Earthly Portions. How's that for a title? But he says, A Christian knows that death shall be the funeral of all his sins, his sorrows, his afflictions, his temptations, his vexations, his oppressions, his persecutions. He knows that death shall be the resurrection of all his hopes, his joys, his delights, his comforts, his contentments. So if you would, I ask that you open your Bibles with me this morning to 2 Corinthians 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21, and you're going to want to uh, mark there, um, maybe underline it in pencil or make a mark in your margins or something. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, Scripture is forthright on the matter of sin. It defines sin as John writes in 1 John 3 and verse 4 that sin is lawlessness. It explains sin by the prophet Isaiah when he says, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. In Isaiah 58 and verse 2. And it presents who is guilty by the hand of Paul. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and verse 23. The spiritual state of humanity is an unman ship. In the middle of the ocean on an overcast night where you can find not a single star. There's no sense of direction. That's the spiritual state of man. You can move but to where? You have nothing to guide you. In 1 John 3 and verse 4, the word lawlessness there, it's best translated as wickedness. And in the original language, it shows possession in what we call the genitive case, meaning that it shows possession of the preceding noun. Now, if you're following me in the context of that verse in 1 John 3 and verse 4, the noun is sin. So the one who practices lawlessness is actually possessing wickedness. Those alienated from God who die in their wickedness are cast out. Micah says they will cry out to Yahweh, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them all the time because they have practiced evil deeds or because they have possessed wickedness. 
Almighty God will hide his face and they will go the way of the chaff separated from the wheat that the wind drives away as recorded in Psalm 1 and verse 4. And they're heaved into the lake of burning sulfur as John writes in Revelation 21. The realm of the dead, David calls it in Psalm 9. Paul calls it everlasting destruction to those in Thessalonica. And Jesus describes it in Matthew 13 and verse 15 as a fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the destiny, to quote Paul again, for those who know not God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So in the context of the message this morning, there is a genuine reason to fear death for many people. But that is not the case for those who are in Christ. Let's go back to our original verse there. He who made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made. Now let's pause there. A student of the Bible will immediately recognize who the he is at the beginning of that verse. But if one isn't sure, the antecedent is only one word over at the end of the previous verse. Verse 20, God. God made. It was his plan, his objective, his design of salvation in the architecture of grace. God who is most holy, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the governor of all creation, he planned to make him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. And as we travel through this text, it's critical to keep that perspective that it was and is God's design. Jesus says in John 6 and verse 38 that he came not to do his own will but the will of the Father who is also our Father, and that His Father is the vine grower, the gardener, if you will. It is God who brings things to fruition. Remember Romans 11, the latter portion of verse 36, or rather, the beginning, uh, excuse me, that from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To put it simply, to boil it down into four words, God is in control. All of that to say God is in control. But that concept flies in the face of everything we see elsewhere, even in the religious world. Benny Hinn, and you've heard me mention him before, Benny Hinn, he's the one who throws his jacket around and has people fall back and start gyrating on the floor. He says this, no. No, never go to the Lord and say, if it be your will. Don't ever say that. The acting of the Holy Spirit is dependent on my words. He will not move until I say it. That's what Benny Hinn says. Really? The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Godhead, is under your control? Really? You could not control when or where you were born. You could not control who your parents were. You could not control the color of your skin, eyes, or hair. You can't control what other people think of you. You can't control other drivers on the road. You can't control how slow or how fast your food gets to you at a restaurant. You can't control the weather, and the list goes on. You can't control any of those things, including whether or not you take another breath, but you can control he who is above all things and more? Really? That's heresy. That is damnable heresy. It's man's hubris and it's unscriptural from the first syllable to the last. You can do nothing. I can do nothing. It's not in our hands. And the first step toward relinquishing this fear of death is resolving that we have no authority over it. And if the first step is recognizing a lack of control, then the second is to have confidence, a surety of your salvation. 
Now, to be clear, when I say surety, I am not referring to the Calvinistic doctrine of eternal security or once saved, always saved, as we normally hear it. What I'm referring to is as John wrote in the first letter outside of his gospel account there in 1 John 5 and verse 13. He said, I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's what I'm referring to. So let's move on very quickly to step two. Look in verses 18 through 20 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to see a word repeated there several times. So we're backing up uh, just, uh, just a little bit. Beginning in verse 18. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their transgressions against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So then we are ambassadors for Christ as God is pleading through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That word reconciled or reconciliation that you see or, or reconciling. Anytime you're studying scripture and you see a word repeated several times within the context, that should be kind of a flashing light. You know, I want you to pay attention to this. And that word reconcile or reconciliation, it means when two parties come to the same position. A part of God's method was to, as verse 18 points out, part of his plan was to reconcile us to himself. And he did this when he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. There could be no reconciliation unless God initiated it, unless God interceded in the destiny of man. And the events of Genesis, they illuminate this for us. First, in the opening three chapters, God creates all things. We agree with that. It starts off in the beginning. So God creates all of this, and then he sets a command, a law, if you will, before his creation. From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. Now, 14 verses later, over in Genesis 3 and verse 6, the man and woman transgressed the command, the law that God gave them, and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God intervenes with punishment and removes them from the garden. Now, let's stop there for a moment. Because I want to, we need to see what Romans records there in Romans chapter 5, the beginning of verse 12. Just as though one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men. And then a few verses down in verse 15 of Romans 5, the latter portion. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift of, by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. Now let, let me ask you this. If God did not make him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, could reconciliation exist? No. Why? Because before Christ, there was spiritual death. Now, we know that people were making sacrifices, but the Bible tells us that the blood of bulls and goats, it's useless. And it's useless because of Christ. Grace could only come from God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, lest any man should boast. So we move forward from Adam and Eve to the flood of Noah in Genesis's. Genesis's. There's just one Genesis, just so you're aware. Genesis chapter 6 through 8. Who told Noah that he, what he needed to do? to save himself and his family, God did. If God had not said anything, Noah would not have saved anything. Who sent the rain? God. Who, who dried up the waters? God. Another question, what if God had not reached out to Noah? Is there anything that Noah could have done to stop the rain? Absolutely not. 
What if God did not lower the floodwaters? Is there anything Noah or the other seven could have done to save themselves? No. Why? Because it was in God's hands and not in Noah's hands. We can look at other examples. Moses and the freed Hebrew slaves getting to the Red Sea. Could they have done anything to part that without God? No. And they would have been slaughtered by Pharaoh and his army. Those events, and there are many that we can't cover because of time, they all speak to the sovereignty of God, the royal authority of God over His creation, where again, from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. Those in Christ have been reconciled to God by God Himself. The first piece of having peace is understanding that we are not in control. And the second is to see that God reconciles people to Himself. It, it, Jesus said in John 6, the beginning of verse 44, No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me draws him. God did not abandon us. We are not made and then set adrift to float wherever the current may take us. We sin. We practice lawlessness. We possess, as John would say, wickedness. We are on our way to the furnace. But God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and verse 8. That Christ, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So step one, we're not in control. Control is an illusion. That's the first step. We are not in control. Step number two, if you're a Christian, you're reconciled to God. And when we realize that people cannot, as Matthew records in Matthew 6, the latter portion of verse 27, add a single hour to our lifespan. Then we'll start to relax and begin to let go of that fear of death. That's how, after encountering the devastating trial of losing everything, Job was able to say Yahweh gave and Yahweh has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. But that's not the end of it. God did not reconcile us to Himself so that we could keep on sinning. And Paul warns us of this in Galatians 5 and verse 13. He writes, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. He reconciled us with a purpose. Now remember those questions at the beginning? The ones we were asking ourselves, or perhaps I was putting in your mind to ask yourself, was I a good husband or wife? A good parent or grandparent? A good friend? What, what would I have done differently? Will they be angry that I left them? Will they be upset at God that this happened and blame them? All of those questions, you, you remember those? Well, understand this. For those that God has reconciled, He is reconciled with a purpose. Remember, Reconciliation means when two parties come to the same position, the same purpose, the same goal. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He has commanded to us or committed to us the word of reconciliation. And you ask, what is that? It is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's the gospel message. That's it. The message is that we can't do anything to save ourselves. That it's God and it's part of God's plan. That the world would be reconciled to Him. The hope we now have, the peace, the stability, the expectancy of Christ's return because God extended grace through Christ we're to share with others for we are ambassadors for Christ. Paul said to those in Philippi, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know what I'll choose. But I am hard pressed between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. While we who are Christians should understand that death is the end of all sorrow and pain, therefore it is a gain for us to die in Christ, to see the host of heaven, to come before the throne, there's work to be done for the sake of other people. The American Quaker Elton Trueblood said, Evangelism is not a professional job for a few trained men, but is instead the unrelenting responsibility of every person who belongs to the company of Jesus. If you wonder, have I been a good husband or wife or grandparent, ask yourself, have I tried to reconcile my family to God? If you wonder, have I been a good friend or neighbor? Ask, have I been a minister of reconciliation in the community? If you wonder, will my loved ones become angered when I pass? Ask, have I taught them how God is in control and that He does all things in His time and to His glory and that it's all part of the bigger plan? It's not about me. Ask these questions. Examine if you have been an ambassador for Christ. And if you've not, you'll be robbed of your peace and you'll remain afraid to die. Why? Why would you be, will remain in fear of death? Because you will know. And so will God, who is to judge the living and the dead, will know that you willingly allowed people to practice lawlessness, to possess wickedness, and thereby die in their sin. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We know that showing a love for God is being fruitful. We know from the text that we've looked at this morning, we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. So yes, if we are not ministers of reconciliation and we just leave it to someone else, if we are not ambassadors for Christ, we're not doing what God is pleased with. And so yes, there is a reason to be afraid. You will not be able to say, and I will not be able to say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Because we did not fight. We did not finish what God reconciled us to do. And we did not have the faith to carry out the mission of the kingdom. Friends, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. It pains me to say this, but you need to hear it. If you are here, or you're watching this online and you're not a Christian, you are not reconciled to God. And as we've seen, there's nothing that you can do to save yourself. And from the verses at the beginning of the message, that is, it's the way of the chaff. It's when they come back and there is the separation of the sheep from the goats. There are many in the world who believe that they are reconciled to God simply because they love God and they show up at services on a Sunday morning. Those are the people that are on the Broadway that are sent for destruction. He says, not everyone who cries out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you're not reconciled to God, and you might ask, well, well what do I need to do then? What is the will of the Father since I can't save myself? And if you're still not convinced, Romans 1, the latter portion of verse 16, it is the power of God unto salvation. Not the power of you, not the power of me. It's the power of God unto salvation. Say, what must I do then to be reconciled with God? What is the Father's will? The first thing is He wants you to hear His Word. And you've heard that this morning. 
Romans 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the testimony of Christ. The gospel message, the gospel message that God was in Jesus, that Jesus came to do the will of the Father. The will of the Father was that he should die on the cross for each and every one of you, for me, that he should die so that we could be reconciled to him. How do you do that? After, after God has done that, well, Acts 2 and verse 38, you repent. A change of mind, a change of heart that results in a change of action. It doesn't make you perfect. It doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes at all. We all make mistakes. It's not about being perfect. It's about being forgiven. You repent, Peter says in Acts 2, 38, and be baptized for the forgiveness, the remission, the passing over of your sins. Because 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you. Not sticking your hand to pray some prayer on a television or getting on your knees in front of a radio broadcast and you know saying, Jesus, come into my heart. That's not anywhere in Scripture. Baptism now saves you. You're buried with Him in baptism, as Paul would write. You rise up a new creation. The old has passed away and you are then reconciled to God. And you try your best to live a faithful life. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Remain faithful unto death and you will receive the victor's crown. That crown of righteousness. That's what you need to do to be reconciled to God. Maybe you're here this morning and you're already a member of the body, but you understand or you see in your own life. I haven't been an ambassador. I've just been sitting on the fence or just kind of treading water. I lack the strength. I need encouragement. I need the prayers of the congregation. God gives that strength. Maybe you need help with understanding. James would write in chapter 1, he says, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you might be perfect, lacking nothing. But then he says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally. He's not holding anything back. But you have to ask in faith. Nothing wavering. You have to ask and you have to believe that God delivers. It's very much like the two farmers. They both prayed for rain, but only one of them went out and started tilling his field. He had faith that rain was going to come. We'll pray with you and for you under the throne of God. Because for those who see themselves not reconciled, there's hope. And what is that hope? that He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. If there is anything at all that you need this morning, perhaps you're not ready to be baptized. If that's you, I would encourage you to speak with me or one of the members here about that after services. You're not ready at this moment, but maybe you have some questions you need to ask. Maybe you need some study or something. Don't walk out those doors leaving your life in the hands of the world. You've already put it off too long. But if there's anything at all that we can do to assist you in your walk with Christ, I would encourage you to make that known by coming forward as together we stand and praise our God.